All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. We'd love you to support this show. Please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Your likes and subscription helps us to grow and attract interviews and content. So please retweet and share our posts. Your contributions are appreciated. Welcome to the KISS FAQ podcast. I'd like to introduce you to the new moderator on the KISS FAQ message board, uh, oh, Mike shit. Granvold. He's going to be taking control on August the 1st, um, and he says he's only going to be a dictator for one day. Mike, does that mean the board's only going to be around for one day? <laughs> oh, you're just coming right out of the gate pissing people off freaking everybody out yeah i'm gonna be running the faq board the same way i ran the kiss online board um well ban hammers end. everywhere I, I was gonna say it didn't end too well did it so um <laughs> no you know going back to the days of the kiss online message board and also i guess the kiss asylum chat room i don't know if you went there back in the day as well um but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of difference between the behavior of a certain um, percentage of KISS fans online and 25, 30 years later, how they're still angry about something. Have you noticed that? I mean, you, oh, you get them uh, in your threads. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and listen, granted, we're talking KISS here. I will, I, I'm going to be very clear. It's not unique to KISS, everybody because I work with plenty of other bands and that same fan craziness, attitude, anger, whatever you want to call it exists in every major artist fan base. So kiss is not unique to this by any means whatsoever. Um, but to your question, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of still the same. I mean, it, it kind of comes down to this message boards and I've been part of message boards before kiss online, before kiss FAQ, before kiss asylum. I mean, message boards are the heart and soul of what the internet, what BBSs were before the internet. I mean, it was just community chat. I mean, AOL was filled with what you could call message boards. Um, they're always, filled with a very small percentage. And by that, I mean like a dozen people or less who really are trying to control the click that's in there. They want to be the self-appointed experts, final say, I, I don't know how you'd want to describe it, but there's always a small clique of fans that want to dictate to everybody else. And that hasn't changed in, Jesus, I mean, 1995 is when I first got on the internet. It hasn't changed since then. Um, I mean, you can see that even today if you just go hang out in a Facebook group or a Facebook page. I mean, there's always... There's always somebody who wants to kind of control what the conversation is. And it's the and, same in, in any area, whether it's like, um, let's say, Marvel, politics, whatever. Every yes. facet of human condition, there's always someone who wants to shout the loudest and drown out the conversation. They want to dominate it in a way, either to only have that single voice or simply to derail other voices from being heard. I mean, that's, it, it's, that's exactly, it. yes, that's a hundred percent the way it is. It still is now. It was that way 30, 40 years ago. Um, and, you know, when I started the Kiss Online message board, one of the things I wanted to try and av avoid was having, if you let those clicks take control they pretty much scare everybody else away nobody's gonna put up with it they're just gonna like my god i came in and i said i like 
Kiss Alive 3 and I got my butt chewed to me and I'm never coming back again. Well, that was an enjoyable discussion. But the problem is in these fan communities, there's a lot of fans who just want to have good, honest discussions. They really do. And when this small minority makes so much noise and gets so vocal and, and can get aggressive and attacking, it drives all those other people away. So it's basically the 1% is driving the 99% away. And then you end up with a message board that's a conversation between 12 people. Yeah. Or, and or some, and what, what, what fun is that? And everyone's afraid to contribute to it or anything. I mean, I, I did create some digital art. For, and you can't really see it in the background. It is my angry ferret in a bubbling cauldron, uh, in a bubbling cesspool. Because uh, it, it does sometimes feel that way. Yet what I have found over, you know, I've been doing the message boards from obviously moderating on uh, Kiss Online um, during during the life of that board to my own FAQ one, which was then had the influx um, when Kiss Online shut down for a long time. That even amongst the most antisocial, the rudest of posters, the people who um, just don't seem to be able to communicate rationally that they'll come out with an absolute gem. And that's probably why I have allowed those boundaries to kind of skew away. I think probably from how you see it, um, you know, we, we have a history of a little bit of back and forth on moderation um, and, and the best way to do it. And I don't think there's one size fits all, but I, I found with some of the people that I've banned, well, apart from the fact there's no way to keep them banned, um, that's the biggest problem um, that they keep coming back. They keep coming back. They keep coming back. But going back to 1995, before we you know get too much into a tangent about the psychology of internet posting and moderation, what was it that brought you online? Because I remember 1993 sitting in my uh, apartment in Buckingham in England with a compact portable two, I think it was, with a plasma orange screen and dialing up to an American BBS. Um, and then when CompuServe hit, I was like in, even though it was like 15, you know, 50 pence per article, you had to pay by the page initially. And then AOL, of course, what brought you online? And when did it start to really fit in with a music? Uh, intro? Um, you know, I would have to say, so my very first computer when they were brand new was a Commodore VIC 20, but I wasn't online at that point in time. Then I moved up to a Commodore 64 and right around that time, the movie War Games came out. Yeah. And I went to a sneak preview of War Games. And I was just like, this is the freaking coolest thing in the world. You know, and and then I became, and I don't think we had, we still had BBSs back then. AOL didn't exist yet. Yeah. Um, but there were BBSs. And I started playing around with BBSs. I didn't quite get hooked on BBSs. Mainly because, you know, if if anybody really digs into what a BBS was, it's not this massive community of fans all online at once. It's somebody like you or me who connects their, their Commodore 64 to a phone line and leaves it connected and somebody else can dial in. Yeah. There might be one. If, if you were a fancy BBS, you might have two lines to allow two people to come in at the same time. But that was the extent of those communities. So it was like sort of one person walking, coming into a BBS, perusing, reading, posting, then leaving. And then the next person came in and saw it all. So there wasn't the instant back and forth chatting and conversations that we have nowadays. Yeah, it was like the so, phone book. And in England, we would have uh, computer magazines that would have whole listings of BBS phone numbers yes, at the back, yep. them, like the yellow pages. So you yeah. find your find your topic, music. Oh, that's a good, uh, you know, BBS for that. So, you know. It, and, it was, and, and, and listen, you're right. It's somebody's phone number. There was never a guarantee that the BBS was going to be online when you wanted to might call not be them. Running. Yeah, not running. So, I mean. It was my first little taste, but I really didn't get hooked on it because I found it to just be not fulfilling, not satisfying. But then I started playing around with um, the bigger dial-in services, CompuServe, Delphi. Um, oh, God, what were some of the other ones? There was, 
There was one that began with a P, wasn't there? I can't uh, remember. There were there were two or three big dial-in services where, you know, it, it became more of a larger message board. You could have multiple connections going. Now, the big constraint was you paid by the hour, basically, that you were connected. So it's not like you could just sit online all night and just chat, chat, chat. It's like, dude, you know, you paid. You paid to, to log in and subscribe to those services. But I remember using Delphi to first connect to the Internet. So, again, pre-AOL, pre-what you've got now. And we're talking first half of the 90s. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you an exact year. I mean, I launched my first website, Kisotaku, in 95. I'm guessing this would have been 93-ish, something like that, maybe, maybe 92. I don't know. I mean, and, and this doesn't take into account that when I was at college, yes, I had access technically to the Internet in college. But it, it really wasn't the Internet back then it was just university computer systems connected to shared data it was was basically a mainframe back then it was a main it was a mainframe but i remember delphi a a a dial-in service was one of the first ones that said you can connect to the internet through delphi now again i'm advising everybody forget about what you think the internet is like right now we're talking way back then in the early 90s this is this is the dark ages of the internet. Connecting to the internet meant logging into Delphi. And then I think I used a tool, and I kid you not, I think it was like called Gopher, was was a web, an internet tool that you put in this address of a, another com- mainframe computer system somewhere else. And I think I picked something like in Sweden or something like that. I'm sitting in Illinois and I connected to this computer in Sweden. Now, what did I do? I did nothing because back then it was more of, holy shit, I actually did this. I'm sitting in Illinois and I'm connected yep. and able to give commands to a computer in Sweden. That literally was the extent of, this is fucking cool. At, <laughs> I mean, three, at 300 baud. At 300 baud on a phone line, paying for that connection. I was just like, this is fucking cool. And then I realized, okay, I connected from Illinois to Sweden. And then at that computer in Sweden, I could put a command in to connect to another computer in Germany. And I'm just like, this is pretty freaking amazing. Now I didn't do anything constructive with that. It was just more of- Well, you didn't play a game like thermonuclear war? Exactly. exactly. Um, Didn't download all of my my movies and videos and graphics and music, please people. I mean, edit, I, edit I, your I, school I, grades. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, I remember, I'm sure you can remember this too, Julian, back in those days, 300 baud modem, then there was a 1200 baud modem and maybe a 14.4 and ended up with 56.6. You would connect via a modem and download a JPEG file. And I kid you not people, it would take 12 hours to download a single JPEG image. Yep. And God forbid somebody picked up the phone while you were connected overnight and broke the connection. It's just all gone. So that that's kind of when I got started in it. And, and then, so fast forward a little bit to around 95, I was managing the advertising network at a home improvement chain. Midwest home improvement chain in Chicago. And part of my job as a computer network person was, you know, keeping up on the latest trends and what's happening in technology. And a couple magazines were talking about this interesting new language called HTML, and it's for connecting websites. And you build these websites and the computer, you log into the internet, you visit this website, you get information. I'm like, this is pretty freaking, this is an interesting concept. And why it really connected to me was right around that same time, I was like, I kind of want to start a Kiss fanzine on my own. And I had access to a lot of 
high-end professional graphic tools where I was working. Quark Express. I had access to do printouts of of high quality printouts for that would they would use to print the Sunday inserts for all their ads and everything. But I could print stuff out on there as well. And I'm like, well, gee, you know, I don't cut down on my cost. I can use all these tools here. But then I was still thinking, I'm like, it's just not an efficient way to do this because I build this fanzine and then I still got to ship it to people. I got to mail it to people. <laughs> you got to subscribe to me, send me money. I print out 50 copies and I stuff them in envelopes and I mail them. I'm like, that's just not fucking scalable. That's not efficient. There's nothing. Didn't appeal to me. Um, then I, we started getting a tool that within Quark Express, which for those who don't know, Quark Express, I don't know if it, I think it's still around, desktop publishing software very high-end software that instead of and again this is going to seem foreign to people but we're talking we're talking the mid 90s instead of saying print this design to high high res black and white output you could print it to a pdf file and this was brand new back then i mean pdfs were new I, and i was like oh this is an interesting concept so now i don't have to do I don't have to incur printing costs. I could just print to a PDF and it's a digital PDF file. And anybody who's got a computer can open the PDF file with an Adobe software program. How do I get them the PDF? I don't know. Maybe I mail them floppy disks or, you know, again, FTPs and drop boxes and all that stuff was, was pipe dreams back just then. The it didn't exist. Yep. Just imagine, they probably weren't even imagining that back then. Um, so I played around with that for a couple, uh, for a month or two. And I probably, honestly, I probably got a floppy disk somewhere in a storage box somewhere with a very first version of a Kiss fanzine that I was trying to figure out. But that didn't quite solve what I wanted to do either. And then right at that time, HTML, the internet, the web was being talked about. We're talking 1995-ish. Um, and I believe, and, and you know, we'll get corrected, obviously, if I'm wrong. But that was about when the internet was opened up to commercial use by the government. Because prior to then, the internet was only used for education and defense use. The the infrastructure existed, but you could only use the internet for educational use, colleges, or defense department stuff. And mid 90s, they opened it up and said, you can commercialize the internet now. The average person can use the internet to do what they want. And, and I think that's sort of how I was able to get on the internet through Delphi. So it was starting, the, the walls were coming down people were trying to figure out how to get mass numbers of users in there. And, you know, and we're talking mass numbers of users. We're probably talking a couple thousand, you know, and we're not talking millions of people back then. Um, but I was like, well, gee, this HTML would be a great way to build a fanzine. Like literally I build this fanzine as a website. I put it up on a web hosting server. And then the fans come to my website to read my fanzine. This is the perfect solution. There's like no distribution costs. There's unlimited distribution potential worldwide. And all you got to have is a computer to connect. That's it. So I had, I had um, my, my, I accessed the internet through my local ISP. And again, remember back then you didn't have cable broadband. You didn't have fiber. You didn't have DSL. You didn't have Wi-Fi. You use dial up phone numbers. And prior to like AOL taking over and MSN, every city had sort of their local ISPs, which frankly were just couple guys, a couple computer geeks that got a bunch of computers, put them in a room, bunch of phone lines, or in their cases, they were 
they paid to get like a T1 line dropped into their if their you were inter- lucky because if you, you were you lucky all the varying service levels i mean you could still yep. have 56 uh what was it 57.6 or whatever it was k all the way down to 24.4 or 28.8 whatever it was and i've still got some yep. of these modems sitting around it's embarrassing but it was difficult it, it 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 was yeah it was but well it was difficult looking back now we didn't there was nothing to compare it to back then it was awesome I mean, back then. It was awesome. I mean, I yeah, I'm connecting to the internet with a 14.4 modem. And like I said, it took me all night to download a JPEG. But what the hell am I comparing that to? Nothing else existed before then. So this was the peak performance. This was the peak um, hardware, the peak configurations. Um, but back then you would call your local ISP, connect to their computer system, and then they would connect you out to the internet. And they gave you a little bit of shared server space on, on their, their servers there, you know, to build your own website. Now, again, keep in mind websites back then, um, basically were text and a few graphic still images. That was it. Video didn't exist on the internet. Audio didn't exist. Um, it, w- it was text. It was pretty much 100% text-based. So these web websites, web pages were like 4K in size. I mean, it's basically you just uploading a, 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 a Word document file of text code. Not even a Word upload- document file. It was more like a typewriter Te- in one. Yeah. It was so basic in terms of the text and the formatting. Yeah, that that that's it. You up, your web site was a text file you uploaded to their server, and then you would have a directory that you could upload images to, and the text file referenced the path to the image in that folder. And if somebody connects to your HTML file, like magic, you've got a website. So I figured I want to lo- I need to learn how to do this HTML because I thought it was cool but it was also part of my job to understand what this future could hold because I'm already sitting here going wow this is good I mean I'm 1995 home improvement chain I'm like oh we could put these Sunday ad flyers up on the internet and then people could go see the flyer on the internet Commerce didn't exist. You couldn't pull out a credit card and buy something back in 19, 1995 on the internet. I mean, none of that existed, but it was it was people like us that were there early going, hmm, could I do this? Is this possible? And, and that's how everything sort of exploded. So it was 1995 when I launched Kiss Otaku. It was like three pages, three pages three simple web pages and it was just me learning how to do html because back then again it's important to remember um there was not a single book written about the web the internet html programming nothing nothing existed you you could walk into a a b dalton bookstore and there wasn't even a section of internet books that existed there just wasn't there were there was computer technology but nothing about the internet the internet was so damn new that nobody had done anything with it and the only way natural area evolution for the computer magazines because if you remember back in the vic 20 days that was my starting point as well um straight into 64 as well which is is weird we'd get the magazines and they they just have long printings of basic oh, code God, yes. programs and that became you know those magazines transformed themselves into teaching us html yep because yep. my entry point and i think it was the same with steve when he was on your show recently it was to teach ourselves html and to build little web pages primarily disseminating information uh which my first one was mr blackwell's kiss experience which was built on i remember the, that one yeah yeah the, it was the free space that was provided by my aol account um that yep. allowed me to have my first website and all it was just like you I wanted to learn HTML. Why? Because it was interesting. I At the time, I was in a factory building uh, computers in Scotland, and OS2 Warp 3 had come out. And 
it had some HTML elements to it um, at the time. So I was like, oh, I want to learn this. This might come in handy. And what am I interested in? Kiss shit. So yeah. it, it just naturally came if, together. If, if, if I'm going to teach myself how to program, I'm going to do it with something I love and that I enjoy. And then maybe if I learn enough out of this, I can go back to my job and go, hey, look, we can do this. I've already done something. I know how we can do this. Um, but yeah, it was it was a whole different experience back then because the only way to learn how to write HTML programming and build a website was you went to somebody else's website yep. and you went up to the top and you said view source, and it turned the web page into just the text that built that page. You copied it all, pasted it into your text editor, and then you changed their code to do what you wanted to do with your code. There, That was how you built websites. It was all hand-coded. There wasn't a single piece of software yet that let you do drag and drop and drop downs and none of that existed. You literally opened up a blank text document and bracket HTML bracket. And you know, it was just, you, you did all of this and then you would upload it to your server and visit it and go, fuck, something's broken. Oh, I put, I forgot to put a comma in this line. Anybody who's a programmer today will know that feeling. It's the same today. You forget you forget a period, you forget a comma, you forget a a closing bracket, breaks everything. And then you gotta scroll through and go, where what did I fuck up? What did I ah there it is? Bracket there, there save, were no upload. We're not intelligent programs. I got my first web editing program in like nineteen ninety six off a floppy off the front of a computer magazine. It was called Web Edit. And it was my go to HTML editor. All it did was put in bold tags, italics, and H1, H2, H3, all your headers. Um, that's all it could do. And I actually used that until it became incompatible uh, around Windows 7. And, you know, the KISS FAQ has never been a high tech, um, you know, website in terms of the the front end stuff. It, it only got a CSS page, I think, about nine years ago. But I would still, I still do everything in HTML because I just can't learn that new shit. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I kind of miss, not that I've had to edit a web page or a website in years, but I remember when I last had to do that, I kind of was like, shit, how do I find a basic web editor? I don't need these fucking fancy things that you buy today that have all the bells and whistles. I just want to be able to, to, to look at the code. And, and basically, it was going back to using a text editor. And and I, I think and you'd probably agree. I'm glad I learned that way because that gave me the understanding of the underlying core technology that drove the internet, that drove the, the explosion of websites. We understood how they work. And as things got fancier and it's like, oh, you can have flashing text now. Okay, it's just another code. I already understood how it worked. As opposed to people that were coming in now using, you know, any of the Adobe software or anything that was being made that was hiding all of that code from you and making it kind of like what you see is what you get, editor. Ugh. You don't understand what is happening behind the scenes. Like, if this is broken and not working, I know exactly what to go look for. In a WYSIWYG, what the fuck are you going to do? You, you don't have a clue why it's not working. So I'm glad I got to learn it that way because it really gave me a great understanding. But it's also impressive to see how websites have gotten so complicated, fancy, feature rich. I'm just like, man, this is such a long way from, I remember when we could first upload an animated GIF. That was the coolest thing in the goddamn world to put an animated GIF on your website. Whoa, I can change the color of the text. 
oh my god, this is this is the end of the world for me. Transparent backgrounds must have blown your transparent. mind. Transparent. They made me so happy. I was like, this is awesome. Transparent backgrounds. I also remember it. Now, granted, at, by this, nowadays, everyone's going to like, they were the death of everything. But frames, it's like, oh, my God. Frames oh, God. were a godsend when they first arrived because they solved the problem. But then they got very bloated and out of control and destroyed websites. But, you know, and, and server-side includes that you could start like just dropping a generic piece of code in and it would always just pull in whatever's in this file. So all I got to do is update this one little file and it updates everything through the website. Oh God, it no was... one look at the source code to the FAQ front pages because I've got includes, tables. It's all uh, still, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm yeah, still ta in tables. Yeah, I tables can't, I can't were, learn these were... new packages any more than I can learn in design. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I just, yeah, I've, it... I've tried, I can't handle it. Um, so I well, you should you, you talk, talk talk to Ross. He probably help you learn these new packages. He, he, <laughs> he mastered in design. Oh in man, that, he's still on page one of that one. Uh, yeah. It, so it's so tough. And, and it's tough. It it you know, it was an exciting time back then, as we kind of had when we had Steve Steerwalt on a couple weeks ago. I mean, when I launched my website in 1995, it was it was honest to God truth. It was the fifth website on the entire internet about kiss i mean that's just mind-blowing to think about now I, when when i launched you know amazon didn't exist google didn't exist um no yahoo eBay. eBay, ebay didn't exist yahoo sort of existed because this is my fun and story I, re I i remember when i first launched kiss otaku it was like may of 95 and of course, you, uh, you and I, and everybody, you'd spend a lot of time in Usenet groups because those were the original message boards. And there's use, they're probably still out there. I just haven't looked. But you'd find that there's a Usenet group for every topic you could imagine. And there was a Usenet group about websites. And you know, as a marketing person, I'm like, okay, I've launched my website. Now I need to promote it. I need to tell people about this website. And there were two guys back in 1995 in a dorm room in Stanford, California that were hand writing a directory of all the websites that existed on the internet. Just email them your website, what it is, the URL and a short description, and they'll add you to their directory. I'm like, great, free promotion. Put me in your directory. Those were the two guys who started Yahoo. And I wish I wish I had that email where I sent it to them saying, here's my new website. But I, I, I definitely remember it was two guys, dorm room, Stanford, California. They were, they were college students, handwriting, hand coding, no databases, nothing. A directory of websites that, as we now know, I mean, Yahoo exploded and that Google ate their lunch, but that directory of the internet is what really made the internet accessible to everybody. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a time where nobody really knew what the internet was for yet. But nobody knew if they needed to be there, what they should be doing there. Um, it was, it, you know, again, it was the Wild West. Companies were like, do I need a website? What do I do with a website? You know, is it just a flyer? Um, and it, it was an exciting time to be there. Now, I had, you know, and right around that time, Kiss Asylum launched. Um, the, the AOL was starting to explode now. So AOL had kiss boards in there and gene was actually active on the aol kiss boards for a while um it was it was an exciting time to be a kiss fan because all of a sudden your world opened up because i remember one of the primary things i thought was so cool about launching my website was i could post a scan of a magazine cover that I have 
And somebody in Brazil who's never seen it can now look at this and go, oh, my God, I've never seen this before. That's the coolest thing in the world. And then I started getting emails from KISS fans around the world. They'd be like, hey, I wanted to send you this picture of a newspaper article or this picture of KISS when they played here. Or, and I was just like, wow, I've never seen this stuff before. I'm going to put it on my website so other fans can see it. And it that was the coolest thing in the world was like, I'm sharing what I have about KISS to the world. The world is sharing what they have back to me. And I'm turning around and putting it back there for the rest of the KISS fans to see. And as a KISS fan, it was an amazing time because we were just overwhelmed with all of the new things that were being shared, that we were seeing, news rumors. Oh, Gene made an appearance here at this radio station in Kentucky. Jesus, I never knew about, heard about that in Illinois. And that was such a cool thing. You know, it was there was no... There was no real competition. There was no real hatred, anger, attacking going on. I mean, you know, Kiss Kiss hadn't really, you know, in 95, the reunion hadn't happened yet. Um, people weren't wearing other people's makeup. All the shit that broke the Kiss army, in my opinion, that didn't exist. We were just a bunch of fans having a great time supporting the band we loved and getting to know other fans around the world who, you know, decades later, we're friends with them. And we probably would have never met them without the internet and the KISS world, the KISS community that people like you and I and a few others were starting to build back in the mid-90s. It was and and it was the right time in the right place because obviously a year later in 1996 the reunion happens kiss explodes and here we are already established on the internet and it was like perfect timing to be there to be doing that yeah but even back then we weren't thinking about metrics we weren't thinking about how many followers or any kind of the the ego side of stuff we, it was all very invested in just sharing. And yep. I, I remember in the uh, the Kiss Army Online on AOL had some real lunatics in there. I mean, the, the lunatics have always been there. Um, but when you look at the internet and the Kiss community specifically today, what do you think it retains of that original kind of ethos that we had? I mean, yeah, the Chris Whites, the Steves, uh, you, me, um, Paul from Kissing UK, any of the early websites were just out there. We were None of us were thinking really about what we were doing. We were just doing. And it kind of, it led in different directions for everyone. I know, uh, and I, I want people to watch your episode with Steve because there's a, a, a lot of really good information about the early era. Um, but you went in one direction with Otaku that you only wanted to do the official news. Chris and Asylum went in a, a different direction that they just want to present news, you know, so I, I was a regular contributor. I think I sent stuff to you. I think I know I sent a lot to Chris back in the yeah, day. Yeah, you know, the, the Kiss Asylum wanted to do real official news, rumors, everything under the sun. Yeah, I mean, none of us had a, a grand plan of where we were going to go and what we were hoping to achieve with any of this. Um. I mean, you know, when I set out to build Kiss Otaku in 95, I didn't set out to do that as a way to get a job working for Kiss. I think as I, I alluded to sort of jokingly with Steve Steerwall a couple of weeks ago, we all dream about working for Kiss. I mean, what Kiss fan doesn't dream about some uh, something happening where you get a job working for Kiss? And I remember that as a kid, too. I mean, I... I I remember back in, 19, and I, I think I shared this on a, on a podcast episode months ago, um, back in 1987, I was graduating college and I'm sending out resumes. I'm like, ah, for the shits and giggles of it, I'm sending a resume to the KISS office in New York City. Just send them a resume. And, and I've got the letter I got back 
from Chris Lent saying, we don't have any openings right now, but if you're ever in town, I'd be happy to meet with you. You know, I, I knew that was the that was the polite brush off. There wasn't a you job. got a response. But I got what a response. Think? I got a response from this guy who back in 1987, I had no fucking clue who Chris Lent was. I'm sure most of us back in the mid 80s had no idea what what Chris Lent's role was in the kiss world. All these years later, you know, it comes back and you're like, holy fuck, that's 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 pretty fucking cool that he took the time to reply back and send me a letter saying, no, but if you're ever in town, happy to meet with you. But that just illustrates we all dream of it, but we all also know it's not a dream that's probably going to ever come true. So. No, you but know, that, did, that didn't stop you from sending no. a letter. It didn't stop you from sending faxes, you know, in the 90s to or emails to Gene. It didn't stop me from faxing Polygram in New York and nope, getting a phone not call at all. back from or a letter from Robert Conti, you know, because I criticized the writing on the liner notes of the remasters. Um, you know, y- you would just do it. I mean, we, we didn't have any rules. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. It's like well, that, that, on the that, phone to phonogram and say, hey, you know, I hear Carnival of Souls is coming out. Can I do some internet promotion for you? You know, and they're like, back then they didn't know what the internet was. or They didn't know what it was. They were, they were like, yes, yeah, send send this crazy Kiss fan a press kit and they'll be happy. Here's no, 20 posters, 20 CDs, you know, give them out. You know, you're you know. 100% right. We, we, we kept doing it. Why? Because we just wanted to do something cool with Kiss. I wanted to promote the band that I loved. I wanted to do what I could to spread the word for the band I loved. I wasn't doing this with the express intention of getting free tickets, meeting the band, doing interviews, uh, getting paid, getting hired. That No, no. All of us did this because we wanted to do this and we had no expectations in return for what we were doing. That in itself, I think, is is a very important factor in all of this because you probably see it. I see it all the time, and not just in the Kiss world either. It's so easy for anybody to start a podcast today, websites today, review stuff today, but a lot of people do that for the intention of, I want to get free concert tickets. I'm only doing this for free tickets. I'm only doing this to interview artists. I'm only doing this so I can sell ads across my website and Amazon affiliate links so I can make money. And I'm like, that's great. I mean, if that's what you want to do, great. But I believe if that's your purpose and intention, it's never going to be fully recognized for what you're doing. People like people, meaning bands, artists, musicians, they like to find the people who are doing it out of their heart because they love it, not because they're trying to to monetize this and make a living from it. They, you know, no, no band likes people trying to make a living off of their name. Uh, You know, Gene's notorious for that. You make, make too much of a living off of the kiss name. You're getting a cease and desist from me. If you're doing this out of the goodness of your heart, we will work with you all you want. And you know what? You don't have to ask. You'll eventually get those perks. They'll come your way eventually, but not because you said you owe it to me. That's the worst thing any fan could say to any artist. Well, I built this website to promote your album, your tour, your band. You owe me backstage passes. The second that happens, you're blacklisted. They don't owe you anything. They didn't ask you to do this. Kiss didn't ask me to start on the internet. They didn't ask you. They didn't ask any of those early pioneers to do anything. I mean, freaking Gene had no clue what the internet was back then when this was all happening. So they don't owe us anything. And, you know, I, 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 I start again, I started Kiss Otaku just because I wanted to learn and then I wanted to promote and it was the right place at the right time. And the thing just took off. It just exploded. What I had going for me is I had prior to that worked in the music industry. So I understood record labels. I understood 
concert promotion. I understood management companies. I understood how that all works and what they want to see if they're going to give you information. So that's why I took the avenue of I'm only posting official news, confirmed news, not not crazy rumors, because I know even to this day, so many people don't like all the crazy rumors that that follow bands around. So I stuck to what was confirmed. And, you know, I reached right out to Doc McGee's office and I introduced myself and hi, this is what I'm doing right now. And I would love to help promote your shows if you want to send me tour dates and press releases. And they said yes. And I mean, it, it, it actually got to the point when we're, when the tour started, they allowed me to buy two tickets from the band's um, hold for every show on the tour. And what I did was I went out on the internet again, 96, put the word out to Kiss fans and go, do you want to, you want tickets to review the Kiss show coming to town? I said, reach out to me. If you want to, I can connect you so you can buy two tickets. They weren't free. They were face value, but they were going to be damn good seats. Main floor maybe within the first 10 rows or stage stage left, right, that first section right there. I mean, the band only holds the best tickets for their own use. They let me buy them at face value. So I ended up getting fans going to every single show, reviewing, taking photos. In exchange, they agreed to send me that review, send me those photos. I posted them on my website just got bigger and bigger and you know all I had all these reviews from all these fans and everybody wanted to get access to tickets but that's because I knew how to work with management and not go in there and like I want two tickets to every show fuck that they don't they didn't even need to sell them to me cuz as we know those shows were all selling out they didn't yeah. need help with anything but fine, if, if you came right out and just said you're willing to buy them, no problem. We'll we'll set you up with that. You know, here's 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 the form, fax this into us, credit card information, and God, you'll have two tickets. Years. Yeah, it hasn't changed for years. And yep. you'll have two tickets under your name at will call. No passes, just two damn good tickets. Um so I you know, I just I worked within quote the system of the record label of the of uh, management of of everything, so I wasn't doing stuff to piss them off, rock the boat, whatever you however you might want to. Was I kissing their ass? No, I just wasn't doing stuff that I knew a record label would just weren't spitting on them. Yeah, I wasn't spitting on them. It was just like. Okay, I'll leave it to um, Kiss Asylum to talk about, you know, Carnival of Souls being leaked all over the place and where it is on the internet. I'm not going to do that because I know the fucking record label would be pissed. They don't want they don't want you promoting, you know, a leaked audio being out there for an album that who knows it's ever going to be released. Um, and you know, I I did stuff like, oh yeah, I'll put links up to buy your T-shirts at you know your your merchandise store through your your um, your uh, licensing company, you know things like that that just look good, and it and I think I shared this in the episode with Steve when the before the reunion, but after I had launched in '95, so this would have been at in at the official Kiss conventions, I gave Gene a three-page proposal to do a KISS website. This would have been, well, I mean, it would have been 95. You know, I launched in May of 95. And I remember backstage at the at the Minneapolis KISS convention in Bloomington, handing him this three pages. And I don't know, he probably looked at it and 
gave it straight to Tommy and like, I don't know. He's probably was like, I don't know what the fuck a website is. You know, it means nothing to him. But I, and, and my intention there wasn't to have them like hire me and pay me a boatload of money to do it. It was more of like, could you just make me the official website? Yeah. I'm already here. I'm already doing it. Just make me the official website. I don't know if I, I don't know because I've never talked to Gene or anybody about that. I don't know if that planted the seed. Um, I doubt it because I do know the way the way Kiss Online came about was in August of 98, just before Psycho Circus came out. Uh, and I had worked with Gene online for history too he had um i had first reached out to gene to help volunteer to promote the kiss conventions and he put me in touch with tommy thayer and said sure do whatever you want and then i think at some point maybe gene or tommy reached out and said would you be our internet point of contact for history too if you put the word out on the internet Fans can mail stuff to your P.O. box. You gather it all, sh ship it all back to KISS. I'm like, sure. That I did as a paid gig. I said, I'll do that, but you're going to pay me to do that. Because I knew you, this was creating a book that they were going to sell and make money from. Fair as fair. And he had no problem, absolutely no problem paying me for that. Um, so I had a little connection working experience with Gene. Fast forward to 98, he leaves me a message. Mike, uh, I got a business proposition I'd like to talk to you about. Please call me back at your earliest convenience. What the hell could this be? Call, call him back the next day. He's like, um, you know, the gist of it was, we're going to build an official KISS website. What are you doing and would you be interested? And my first reaction internally was, damn straight, I'm interested. And yes, I will do this. But on the phone, I'm like, I have to think about this. I've got a full-time job that pays me well. It's got full benefits, all of this other stuff. Um, he goes, well, think about it. Call our manager, Doc McGee, talk about it and see if we can make this work. And it still sticks with me today because one of the parting comments he made was, Mike, um, all I can do for you is open a door. I can't promise you what's on the other side of that door. I can't promise what's going to happen if you go through that door. All I can do is open a door. You have to make that decision. And I was like, literally Morpheus, oh, huh? Yeah. I mean, all these years later, what wise words. He gave me the opportunity, but I had to take the opportunity. I had to go pursue the opportunity, and I had to make something out of that opportunity. He wasn't going to do all that for me. Um, fast, long story short, talked to Doc. Um, I was flying out to L.A. for the Psycho Circus press conference on my own money to cover it for Kiss Otaku. I had gotten passes from McGee to do this. They were like, tell you what, fly in the day before, go to San Francisco, meet with Del Ferrano and our merchandising company at Sony Signatures and talk about this. Because Sony Signatures, who does all the KISS merchandise, who eventually became Epic Rights, um, had somebody, a company that was paying to do official KISS website. So it was a product. That's why that's why Kiss Online happened. It was essentially just another product. Some company said we're going to give Kiss money to create the official Kiss website. It was managed and controlled through Sony Signatures, and um, Gene basically ISP, won. It? it started as an ISP. Yeah, I'll I'll get to that real quick. It and and Gene's one comment to this company was if you're going to do a Kiss website. We want somebody running it who knows KISS, who understands KISS, who gets the KISS fans. We don't want some project manager who 
tomorrow is building a website for soap or something like that. You know, so good on Gene to go, we want somebody who, who's going to represent us. And and this isn't really ego talking, but back in 98, I was I might have been the only one or one or two of the only people in the world who was a major Kiss fan, understood Kiss, understood Kiss fans, understands how to build websites, understands the internet. It was a small group of people back then, very small. Um, I got the job. I mean, it was it was it was the easiest job interview I ever had. The Del Ferrano, the CEO of Sony Signatures, goes, "So, Mike, how much do you want to do this?" That was his first question to me in the job interview. I'm like, if that's the first question in a job interview, you got the job. Yep. You know, there's there's no qualifications. There's it's just how much do you need and when can you start? And again, that was Psycho Circus press conference, um, which wasn't that like mid to late September, I think, in 98. Um, by Octo- mid-October, not even a month later, I had resigned from my job as a network manager at Montgomery Wards in Chicago and was moving from Chicago to San Francisco to start this new job, to build a KISS website. That's it. That was my only job, was to build and run a KISS website. And it was like that moment where I'm like, God, I just went from being a KISS fan to being a professional paid KISS fan. Just do what you love, Mike. Do what makes the KISS fans happy and just whatever you want. It's yours. I mean, I, Gene and Paul, for that first couple of years, they weren't involved in any of it. There was little direction, little anything that do this, don't do that. Because I think they understood I knew the boundaries not to cross on my own. Don't post rumors. Don't post bullshit. Don't do that. Sort of. They didn't have to tell me that. I knew that. Um, and so getting back to our me- our mess and 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 to your point, yes, Kiss Online started as a dial-up ISP. Somebody was building a dial-up ISP. There was a short period of about a year where that was the latest and coolest thing for artists to do. When Kiss did it, David Bowie had done one, Megadeth had done one. Um, you know, instead of calling, instead of paying your monthly subscription to AOL and using their numbers to dial up, pay your monthly subscription to Kiss. We'll give you dial-up numbers all over the country to dial in and get on the internet. But we're also going to give you all this cool Kiss stuff on top of it. It was an interesting concept that didn't work out for anybody in the long run, not just kids. <laughs> that, that I remember. I mean, it, it it was it was it was it was like okay, if we can charge people twenty bucks a month, we'll get a small number of people to pay twenty bucks a month. And I was immediately going like, you know, let's get rid of this membership fee. Let's open this up, make it free to everybody. And sell a shitload of merchandise, but it was trial and error. No one knew that back. Nobody then knew what was yeah. possible and what wasn't possible, and also what, what, how much the market could take. What what the consumer what the consumers wanted. So it it started as a perfectly good intention, but you know, living and breathing it daily, I'm like, you know, and I don't I don't remember the number, so I'm just making this up. You know, okay, so we had ten thousand subscribers, but the free sections that I had on the website were getting a hundred thousand fans visiting it. And I'm just like, so let's just go for the large numbers of people here and let's really integrate merchandise. Let's sell kiss t-shirts, all of this merch that, that kiss is known for. Let's build an email list, you know, kiss, like anybody back then, they had no fan direct contact communication. You know, within a year, I had built an email list of like 60,000 KISS fans that we could email new t-shirts and new this and new that and a new greatest hits is coming out and whatever. I mean, 
And and obviously we learned and everybody learned that's where you made your money on the internet. It wasn't selling a membership fee to that website. No, but you it were was also getting investing. all these people in. The the business what struck me and I, I was jealous at the time. All of a sudden you had all these resources available to you as a internet designer. Godzilla font. Um, you know, all, all the great graphical elements in the menuing, um, the great artwork that was be done, being done, the Godzilla eggs as well, you know. Yep, the, the, yep. All that stuff. There was a big effort put in visually and in terms of the design. Um, and, and yeah, I know it was a little bit rudimentary at, at launch, but it grew and developed and it actually developed very rapidly. It was absolutely amazing. I mean, how did you feel to be involved in something like that? Did that make it real to have like an art department? I mean, Jesus. It, 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 yeah, I mean, and, and keep in mind, it wasn't that I had people that were creating all this for me. I just had access to all this stuff that was already being created. So, so much of those graphics were being created for tour t-shirts and wholesale t-shirts and other products. So I had access to the entire library of licensing images that any KISS licensee could access. And what I had ad additional access to was I could go into the, the designer who created the Godzilla eggs and I go, could you send me that as a Photoshop layered file? Because I don't want the text on it. I just want the eggs. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Here's, you know, here's a floppy. Here's the Photoshop file. Boom. I could get access to the perfect files I needed, which, which helped incredibly in, in, in creating all of that, that. And, you know, I didn't have to worry about, well, can I use this photo of the band or not? It's in the approved license library. I could use anything without asking for approvals or permission. And even when I designed stuff, nothing was initially being submitted to anybody for approval before making it live. I was just doing it all under my own judgment of what I knew would have been right or wrong, how to best present the band. Um, it, it was it was pretty freaking incredible and and yeah it grew so quickly because you know one of the you know my first official job was going to Dodger Stadium for the Psycho Circus tour and talk talk about a Kiss fan like eyes glazed over not knowing what to 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 do I walk in and they give me a VIP all access laminate here you go. And here's your tickets for the show as well. Now, keep in mind, you know, I'm, I'm just a KISS fan. I'm a music fan. I don't understand the inner workings of laminates and what they get you and what they don't and and the access and all that stuff. There's no, there's no memo they give you to say, here's what this means and doesn't mean. Um, that, first, that first night, I thought, I got a VIP access. I thought that just meant I had VIP access to go backstage, which of course it did. But I didn't realize that also. I learned this quickly a few weeks later. I could go anywhere I want in the venue. And I could take pictures from anywhere I want in the venue. But that first night at Dodger Stadium, I'm like, well, I got my tickets for my seat. So I'm going to my seat for the show. And for the entire show, I was taking photos from my seat. And if... <laughs> I was just like nobody told me I could do more than that. They I just don't come assumed, with instructions. You were they don't come. Them. It didn't come with instructions back. There was no internet to learn what other people had done. Got it? So you know, I'm just this googly-eyed Kiss fan going, "Oh my god!" You know, and they gave me. I think at that point in time, I was using a so digital cameras. Dark Age technology back then. I was using a Sony Mavica, which saved the photos to a floppy disk in the camera. So, and and I know people are going, what? I'm going, yeah, you got to understand. 1998 was, it, it was only not even five years earlier than that, less 
that digital cameras even were first really invented and became commercially available. So I had this little Sony Mavica and, you know, flash drives and all that. Sh none of that existed. 20 megapixels. Heck no. No. I mean, this was probably at best two megapixel camera. Yep. Um, and, you know, low light sensitivity. I mean, it was just, it was, I mean, you could, you can still find some of these early photos floating around out on, on, on social network and the internet. The quality wasn't great, but that's what it was back then. So it would save the photos onto this floppy disk. And, you know, the floppy disk could only hold, I don't know, maybe 30 JPEG photos at two megapixel quality. Yeah. Like I had to, I, I had to have a fanny pack with me <laughs> stuffed with blank floppies. So that one gets full, pop it out, pop a new floppy disk in. And then, you know, at the end of the night, I've got 10 floppies filled with photos. Hope they turned out. Don't know. And, you know, I'm taking, I had access to anything I wanted on these shows other than no dressing room access. I couldn't go into the dressing room. Um, but I could take photos of everything. And and I remember when it got to like the farewell tour and I had upgraded a bit, I was now using a digital video camera to take video and um, stills with one device, but it still wasn't the quality like you've got today. I was probably taking a thousand photos at any KISS show that I would go to. Those were Easily. some of the greatest days of being a KISS fan when you were doing that on the farewell tour was we knew that soon after each show, you were going to do a photo dump for each one of those shows. And it was just absolutely staggering, just the amount of photos that you were generating, but also how you were using that access. It's kind of funny. I was uh, transferring a video the other day, Got Milk Sessions. Remember? being yep. involved in that because i see you and tommy with separate cameras you know photographing the whole proceedings yep. i got i did a screen capture of uh w one of them with both of you in frame i just thought it was absolutely hilarious i i, I, I had, re you, I had you recently, used that access and you shared it i recently found a dat tape of some short interviews i did with three of the guys in the band at the got milk session and i posted it to my my youtube channel um yeah i mean and, and I, I remember the Got Milk. That was also one of the first things I went and did. I had no fucking idea what I should be doing or not doing. I'm in this private photo studio. It's Kiss in makeup, Tommy, Doc, um, and Annie Leibovitz. I mean, come on. Annie Leibovitz is as famous as famous comes when it comes to photographers. I'm like, well, geez, I don't know if I should be taking, should I be taking pictures of what she's taking pictures of? Is that infringing on you know i don't know i don't know i'm just quietly trying to be the fly on the wall taking photos and video because my whole attitude back then was i'm a kiss fan and if this excites me as a kiss fan it's damn well going to excite other kiss fans so back to your point about all the photos yeah i'd go to the these shows and i'd go back to my hotel room after that show and again, remember, there's no high-speed internet. There's none of this shit. And even transferring photos from a camera to a MacBook was not happening at the speed it happens today. I would go back to my hotel room, and I'd quickly like, all right, let me find six really good photos. And usually, once I got started doing all these photos, I kind of understood where I could get some really interesting angles. One of the things I wanted to avoid was I don't want to take the same photos that every every photographer's taking in the pit. You can see those anywhere online. Yeah. You know, I want I want to be taking them where somebody can't go. Side stage, backstage, back of the arena, whatever it might be, different angles, or going into the photo pit once all the photographers have been kicked out, and now I've got the photo pit to myself. It's just me, a couple video guys, and that's it. Um, but I, I would get an idea of, oh, I remember, I, I think I got a great photo of Ace doing this, and I'd 
go through all my photo dump. Yep, there it is. That's a cool photo. And I'd grab about six photos and I'd immediately upload them to the website. Now remember, that immediate upload to the website meant me sitting at a Holiday Inn Express connected through a modem, uploading via a modem, a 56K modem, which could take me an hour hour more to upload these six photos to the website but it gave people a taste of what just happened and then when i got back into the office and we had for the lack of a better term high speed internet connections at the office um i would dump the whole thing and get rid of anything that was really blurry or dark or whatever and then i'd upload a thousand photos from this show because my attitude was as a fan i want to see every freaking thing don't decide for me which photos i should and shouldn't see just give them all to me here's the lot that, there's the lot and i would do that i would just photos 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 and it really brought the fans there was an ulterior motive because I also had the, by, by this time I wasn't building the website entirely on my own. I now had a full-time PHP developer who was coding all of this for me. It started for the first year, year and a half. It was a hundred percent hand coded website, no dynamic, admin backend content management system you know wordpress didn't exist back then nothing like what you're all used to today existed back then so i was using adobe go live to build kiss online and i've got the article somewhere 99 ish maybe 2000 Adobe actually did an interview with me and a feature on Kiss Online because to their knowledge at the time, it was the largest website ever built and managed using Adobe Go Live. Yeah, that's cool. There were like 10,000 files in the website, but it was all individually coded, uploaded. You know, none of that that's the way it was. And frankly, it got to the point where I'm like, this can't be done. I need somebody who can build a management system behind the scenes so I can just upload photos. It's a template design. So we built our own content management system yeah. for Kiss Online very quickly. But back to what I was saying, there was a reason for uploading a thousand photos because I knew Kiss fans would stop and look at a thousand photos. And I put it in such a way that's like page comes up there's the photo next photo new page comes up next photo new page comes up what am i doing i'm making the kiss fans stay on this website engage forever yeah i mean you know and those were the metrics that were were really important it wasn't necessarily how many visitors you had to your website it's how much time would they spend on your website you could have a million people come to your website, but if they only spent three seconds on your website, who cares? They couldn't do anything. They left. We were having fans spending 10, 20, 30 minutes, an hour or more on the website. What does that mean? Every time that fan spends an hour on the website and goes page, 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 I can put another banner on that page. Buy your tour merchandise, another banner. Buy the new greatest hits album, another banner, whatever. I could promote and sell to them because they were glued on the website. And that was all because content. The more content you give people that they like and engage with, the longer they're going to stay there. And the longer they stay there, the greater chance you have of selling them something, getting them to join an email list, doing what you want them to do. And, and that was, that's what I was all about back then was how much content can I keep dumping into this website? So all these crazy kiss fans like us 
spend their entire day doing nothing but clicking through Kiss Online. But it wasn't as cynical as that because, I mean, you've got some of the, my all-time favorite features were the track-by-tracks with Bob Ezrin that you did um, for Revenge and the Elder, the Psycho Circus with Bruce Fairburn, yep. um, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, it, it, it wasn't so cynical. That you you're clicking you're you're keeping me engaged. No, you're, there was you're right. Quality I, there. I, I yeah. I mean, don't don't take my my comments as being cynical, and I'm trying to manipulate and use the fans, because you're right. I I prided the fact on it was a lot of good content. It was a lot of great quality going into this. You know, it was it was everything from, you know, tracking what the demon wrestler was doing at every one of his shows to. Uh, girls of kiss, kids of kiss, share your collections. You know, it was all this stuff that again, I'm sitting here going, well, as a kiss fan, I think it's kind of cool. I do this. I mean, it was fun stuff. It was, it was, you know, and as I got more comfortable with what I was doing and what I could do, then it was like, well, could, uh, Hey, Hey, Doc McGee's office. Could you uh, get me Bob Ezrin's phone number? I'd like to interview him about, you know, um, revenge and and um, elder. Could you get me Bruce Fairburn? I'd like to talk to him about Psycho Circus. We're promoting Psycho Circus, and I was already doing a lot of that stuff pre Kiss Online through Kiss Otaku because I've been finding a lot of these old interviews where you know I've talked to a lot of people, but. Again, I was I was a fan and I was new to this and nobody gave me directions to say, you can talk to anybody you want. Just call us. It was just like, wait a second. Can you do this for me? Sure. No problem. You know, and, and, and I quickly was realizing, well, I could I could do interviews with Gene and Paul, Ace and Peter at a show before a show um, at a rehearsal, whatever it might be. Just make the arrangements and sure. You know, sit down and chat with them for five minutes, ten minutes, and you know, it was it was, you know, one of the last things I did there that I still think is one of the coolest was the Ask Paul feature. Oh yeah, that was you know, and and you know, as cynical as people are about Paul, that was Paul's idea, a hundred percent Paul's idea. Paul said, "Mike, is there a way we can do something where I can answer the?" questions of the fans i'm like 100 percent. i can set it up fans come in here submit your questions and and then paul was like i mike i want you to gather all the questions weed out the crap yeah and and by crap i mean the 90 percent of the questions are when are you coming back to my town you know that sort of stuff which I, I still to this day, it's like you got an opportunity to ask your favorite artist a question, and the question you ask him is, "When are you coming back to play?" What a waste of your question. Um, but there would be good questions, and he'd ask me to go through those. Now, I will admit, sometimes because I think we tried to do those on a on a monthly basis, maybe a couple times a month. There'd be times I'd come up and go, "Fuck." There's only two decent questions here. I'd make up and fill it in with a bunch of other stuff. Knowing Paul, knowing his history, getting him to talk about stuff. Um, but then I, you know, Paul and I would get on the phone and I'd record a phone conversation. I'd read the question to him. And it, it always impressed me. I'd read him the question and he'd pause and there'd be some silence for five, ten seconds as he's thinking of the response. Yeah. And then he starts talking, and it's a very well thought out, smart, educated response. That's all I can say. I mean, Paul is Paul is not the type of guy who opens mouth, speaks inserts foot into mouth, unlike somebody else in the band. Paul doesn't open mouth. He thinks first. Yeah, he'll answer in a paragraph, fully formed. He'll, fully formed, well thought out, 
well, I mean, just great answers. And, you know, and then I'd take that phone recording and I'd, I'd digitize it and edit it. And, and again, it wasn't, it, it, it was, I was a blast, having a blast doing it, but it wasn't easy like it is today to record, edit, and do shit. I mean, it was, you know, take a cassette tape, plug it into the, the, the the mic jack on my MacBook, get software to digitize it, and then start listening to it and editing out. I mean, it, it was a lot of work. It wasn't easy. And I want to say even back then, YouTube wasn't the player at that point in time. No. It might have started, but YouTube wasn't a player. I mean, we were basically just uploading stuff directly to our server. Whether and I can't remember if it was if we uploaded an MP3 file or we converted it to um, was it real music, real audio, real, real audio. Yeah. Um, because again, back then, if we kiss online and we had the opportunity to do this because we had a lot of good connections with people at Apple Computer, we could have put a QuickTime streaming server on our web server. That's not cheap. That's basically postage size video. And that server only handled like two consecutive connections at a time. <laughs> I'm like, what's the point of doing that when we have hundreds of thousands of fans coming into this website? It's just not going to be an experience worthwhile. So it's sort of like, here's the video file. Here's the audio file. Download it and listen to it. Um. Yeah, I rem I, re I even remember some of the earliest video we put. It was just like tiny, 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 like and three hundred very... by two something. It was just yeah, it was just very crap, like you said. pixelated, and oh, it was. But at that time, that was groundbreaking to do because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Julian. Didn't we have like the Dodger stadium show up there on video or audio at one point as well. There was, there was audio from it. I think you had sound check or something. I think we like had that. something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I was always looking for ways to try something new. Here's something that's very, that was thinking out of the box that this was on the farewell tour. So this was 2000. Again, this is way before Facebook, Twitter, any of that existed. There was a website that started, and they were called, I think they were called UPOC, U-P-O-C. I don't think they're around. They're, they're not around. But basically what UPOC was, was an early concept, not by the same people, but it was an early concept similar to Twitter. So I could send text messages out to followers, sort of, uh, you know, 140 character text message. So I built this channel on, I think it was upoc.com. It was Kiss's official channel. And you as a fan, come in here, follow Kiss. You put your cell phone number in. And I'm going to send you messages directly. And I remember using that first night of the farewell tour. And sending people messages about descriptions as I'm there at the venue during soundtrack. Here's what the stage is going to look like. Here's what the set list is going to be. They were getting direct 140 character messages. And it was probably only a couple hundred people that were following. Because, again, that whole social media concept didn't exist back then. But I was always looking for interesting ways to communicate out to the fans and get get them to follow and be more engaged because ultimately I could sit here and go, oh, here here's here's a here's the the new T-shirt and you can buy the new T-shirt in the Kiss Online store, um, you know, and sell merchandise for Gene and Paul. I mean that's what they love. So it was it was such a cool inventive time there were no there were no rules there were no restrictions nobody knew what was going to work nobody knew what wouldn't work um 
but let's go back to the message board. So I remember when I started Kiss Online, you know, I had this conversation with Gene and Paul about, do we want to have a message board? Because I, I don't think it's going to be a, a nice playground for all people in there. And I'm, I'm giving them my honest upfront, you might want to not do message boards. Just leave that to the fans. Let the fans do that. And real quick, I, you, you probably remember this. Remember when Kiss Online first started? The concept was Gene wanted me to reach out to the bigger and better Kiss websites and bring them under the Kiss Online yeah. umbrella. Yeah, the FAQ went in there. The FAQ went in there. We talked to Kiss Asylum. We talked to a couple others. It didn't really work out because the concept was sort of like, Gene, you want them to come under our umbrella, play by our rules, but then that takes away what makes them great to begin and with. And we've got to go through you to upload, which is a real pain in the butt. Yeah, but yeah. it saved Again. me hosting. And you have to remember, at the time, I'd come from Scotland. I'd moved to San Francisco. Uh, Steve had been, ho Kiss Freaks had been hosting uh, the FAQ during that transition period. So, you know... It was hard to find hosting companies back then. So to me, it made sense. Especially oh, no, you, I, I was nothing more than a cost, reference site. It, it cost you nothing. We were like, sure, yeah. we don't care. Upload as much stuff as you want. And it got designed we'll, nicely too. Yeah, you got integrated. So you got a lot of eyeballs because you were there. But that was the original concept of Kiss Online, which which didn't didn't pan out. Um, but I, you know, I tried to inform them of the message board. And they, again... This is Gene and Paul. So I'm telling them I don't think it's a good idea to launch a message board. Gene and Paul are like, no, let's do this. We don't, we don't care if they hate us, if they say bad things about us. They just can't attack other fans. They can't spread lies, that sort of stuff. But if, if they don't like the set list, they don't like the show, they're free to say what they want. So I'm like, all right, you know, sort of. I applaud them. They they had no problem giving the fans a place to speak their mind. And I knew before launching, it's like, I can't moderate this by myself. You know, a message board, especially an official one, that's a 24-7, 365 job. Because it's not just people in the U.S., it's people around the world. So when I'm sleeping, the other side of the world is active and on there. So I had, I think the, um, the first person I think I reached out to was Tim Rawlings. <laughs> I knew Tim prior to Kiss Online because he and I had done stuff together through Kiss Otaku. He was, at that time, and maybe we'll get into this whole thing a little bit later here, Tim was fine, great Kiss fan. Um, I reached out and I said, listen, you know, we're doing the message board. Do you want to be a moderator? It, for Basically, it's like you're volunteering. We're not going to pay you. I can't promise you anything. I can try, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yes. And you were second in line, right? You know, I was, also because you were local. We were both in San Francisco. Yep. So I'm like, do you want to be a moderator? And we had... Um, Boy, there was Susan. Fraley girl. Yeah, Fraley girl. There was, uh, what was her name? There was another girl, big Paul Stanley fan. She had a website like Paul Stanley's Paradise or something like that, I think. We ended up with maybe myself and maybe about four other moderators. And... Oh, I mean, you know, you were in there basically from day one. It was it was a freaking whack-a-mole. Um, we tried. We we on. I feel like. Tell me if I'm wrong. We tried really hard to let opinions be voiced, um, but it quickly gets out of control. Um, you know, and I don't know. I mean. At the end of the day, the message board wasn't the primary source of traffic for Kiss Online. It was, you know, that was all the other stuff on the website. It was a cool area, but it was 
it was becoming the area that took the most amount of time to manage and deal with. Yeah. Of, geez, what about this person? And what do we say with this? And, you know, and we we were getting to the point where it's like, okay, again, because this is an official message board run by a corporation, the Sony Signatures, it's like we can't delete anything, but let's move it all off into this private area where we we held all of the crap that was hidden from view. Um, I still have one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you kind of have to because you got to be able to go back, or you got to be able to hold on to it if you get that phone call one day from the police going, "All right, we need evidence that this really happened." It's like, hey, here here it is. Here's what they they printed out. Um, you know, and and there were rumors that the Kiss Online message board got shut down because somebody posted that Gene Simmons died. I can tell you for a fact that had nothing absolutely nothing to do with it. The Kiss Online message board got shut down for the simple sake of it just turned into a fucking cesspool. cesspool. Yeah. It turned into an unmanageable cesspool, which, all right, you know, let's go back to Tim Rawlings. I'll try and tell the the short version of, of the Tim Rawlings story, which has got so many lies out there on the internet. Um, it was, it it, it it's been stated by people who have no knowledge that I stalked a KISS fan and got him fired from his job. That's not how this happened. That's not what happened. Um, I came into work one morning, and one of the moderators, this Paul Stanley girl, said um, there were posts being made under her name, but not by her. Okay, I log in, and uh, sure enough, there were posts. She wasn't online, and I think most people are aware of this now, but back in 98, 2000, most people didn't realize this. Everything you did was tracked and logged, not just by KISS, every website. So when you logged into a message board, a file was created, and said, oh, this user logged in from this IP address at this date and this time for this long. And they might even give you a whole trail. Where did they visit? What did they post? And everything, everything was logged back then. You know it's happening now. I logged in to the admin back in. I'm like, sure enough, she wasn't online. And the IP address is not her IP address based on all of her other posts. Now, I was pretty much ready to write the whole thing off because, yeah, I could do a trace of that IP address. But remember, everybody was accessing the Internet by dial-up back then. So that meant AOL basically had one IP address for millions of people. Yeah. It, you know, it would be an IP address that would go back to McLean, Virginia. And I'm like, well, fuck. That trail is a dead trail. I'm never going to find who that user is. Or MSN was the same way. They were another big dial-up provider, Microsoft Network. If it was one of those two, I was never going to be able to find out what happened. But it was a unique IP address. And I tracked this IP address to a nuclear power plant in West Virginia. I'm like, that's, that's pretty unique and identifiable. I had no idea who did this or what it was other than somebody from that address logged in, hacked in some form that moderator's password. I sent a message. I went to the website for the nuclear power plant. I found a contact directory, head of security. Here you go. Just letting you know, I think I, I'm like, I run the KISS website and I think somebody hacked into the account of one of our moderators, and here's the IP address that was associated to it. Whatever you want to do, it's your problem. They, they actually emailed me back and said, thank you very much. We will investigate this. This was actually post 9-11 now that I remember it, because that plays in a little bit later. Um, end of story. About 24 hours later, Tim sends me a frantic email. Mike, 
my company is accusing me of hacking into KISS Online. I did nothing. Somebody must have used my work computer to do this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I work here. I'm like, oh, I had no idea. He works at that power plant. I'm like, I, all I know is that IP address was used to log in. I gave it to the head of security. I'm done. There's nothing more I can investigate with this. It's over. And I can't tell him it wasn't you because I also don't know that. You know, we're a Sony corporation. If somebody hacked in, I mean, I immediately had to let our legal counsel know. And this was yeah. all being legally tracked at this point in time. Um, so it is what it is. Well, it escalated really quickly to it was this guy who did this. He guessed the other moderator's password, logged into her account. He had some issues with her. I don't know, her overzealous fandom with Paul. I don't know. I could really care less. Made some statements for her. And I'm like, all right, so you did this. He goes, yeah, but I didn't really try and hack or break anything. I'm like, yeah, but here's, here's what the problem comes down to. And this is the way it is today still. You can't use your work computer for personal items. It's always been that case. Most companies will turn the cheek and ignore it, and it'll never escalate to something like this. But the head of security told me they were able to trace back the login to his individual workstation. And they found a history of him logging into the website. I'm like, I, what do you want me to tell you? I mean, your company policy is you can't use your work computer. I didn't tell you to break that policy. You did that on your own. Well, because this was post 9-11 and it was a nuclear power plant, they were now required to alert the FBI of any hacking in or out of power plant. So they alerted the FBI who came out to investigate and interview. And while all this investigation is going on by his company and the FBI, I guess he was, uh, you know, on leave with no pay sort of thing. Like, we got to figure out what's going on. They, I guess they finally determined it wasn't malicious and whatever. You know, he did break company policy. Yeah. I think, I think his comp, I think his company did let him go because he broke their policy, but the FBI did nothing more. They, they realized it was not malicious. Could have been the end of the story right then and there. He, he took this personal, like I got him fired. And he started emailing Gene and Del Ferrano, the CEO of the company, and Kiss's lawyers and our legal counsel trying to get me fired because I purposely got him fired. And everybody's like, don't worry about it. It's all documented. It's not an issue. Nothing's going to happen. Just, you know, track any communication and let our legal counsel know so we can document all of this, which is what I did. And, I mean, the sad part is this was an overzealous KISS fan who got upset about something some other KISS fan said and went way too far with it. And it's sad, but, you know, there's consequences to doing stupid stuff. I mean, yeah. you do something and, you know, it, it, it honestly, it ended with him making a post in some board somewhere saying, does anybody have Mike's mailing address? I want to send him a Christmas present. Tick, tick, tick. I'm like, I give that to our lawyer and our lawyer is going, I got to turn this over to the FBI again. Yep. That's not that you don't. So again, I just give it to the council. The council's like, we have to turn this over to the FBI. Opens up a whole nother investigation. Like, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's like fans. You there's, there's been a, there's been an unspoken rule on the internet since day one. Count to 10 before you hit that send button. The submit button, whether it's an email, a message board, a comment, 
just type it up, but before you hit, count to 10. Do you feel the same way about it after you've counted to 10? Because I know I've done this to myself a few times where I'm like, yeah, after counting to 10, delete. I'm not, I'm not sending that. That would, that would have been a stupid thing to say, a stupid thing to send. Um, and, and are you as anonymous as you think you are? Because you're not let anonymous. Me, let on me the tell internet. you, um, you know, just going back to 2001, it wasn't the whole Wild West thing that people sometimes think it was back then. And I, I just have a little tangent uh, about hacking. I was working for a firm in 2001, um, and we had a contractor who hacked into the network. He didn't hack in. He had dial-in access because he was a contractor. But then he impersonated and took control of the CIO or CEO's yep, um, account. A- account and post-its and emails that were nasty, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of that, I pulled the logs off the server, proving the access back to his IP address, which he'd been using to dial in as part of his job, and then had the pleasure. I'm not even the person under investigation of spending time with the FBI during the investigation. And let me tell you, it is not a pleasant process, even if you are not the target of the investigation. Yeah, it exactly. Extraordinarily serious business. And it has colored, you know, all the shit that went down with you and Tim um, happened after I already had experienced the FBI as a contributor. Yeah. So it's it's serious, but also the people on the FAQ over the years who I don't think they actually care that they're not as anonymous as they think they are. And IPs and other things that could be used to trace people, there's an art, but uh, again, if people would think before pressing that enter. It's not always the message, it's how you're saying it, you know, because you can say things that are negative. You can say things that are biting without being, well, without crossing a line. Yeah, I mean, that's what it's come down to is you, you know, you can't attack people. Let's just, that's first and foremost what it's evolved to these days, you know, the 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 attack can go only so far before it becomes investigatable and you know this was 10 years ago long after i was dealing working with kiss i was stalked by somebody online through because of three sides of the coin a listener who hated the freaking show for a couple years was stalking me impersonating me attacking me my family my friends my guests and you know i tracked all of it never could find out who this person was but i knew if they did just enough to cross the line the authorities could go further meaning you know when i said well when it hit that aol ip address i hit a dead end well if it was bad enough the fbi could get through that one IP address at AOL and then figure out who it was. So you got to keep that in mind. And, you know, V, you know, you could sit here and go, well, I got a VPN. Yeah. Well, it depends on how intent the investigators are. They can, they can go really freaking deep and open up log files that nobody has access. Oh, to. they will do a full cavity search on your computer infrastructure. Yes, yes, a hundred percent. So you've got to think long and hard. Is it worth saying that? Is it worth making a stupid post mocking a moderator because you didn't like their fandom? That, as I just laid out, ended up getting this guy fired from his job. And my understanding is, even though the FBI did nothing to him, the FBI instructed him to never delete anything he posted online about all of this because it's all there for record and for monitoring. And if you ever cross the line again in the future, what happened in the past is going to come back and haunt you and make it worse. So, yeah, anonymous is not anonymous. I mean... You just, you got to assume if you post something 
if somebody wanted to hard enough, they're going to find out who posted it. Who yeah, did? And you have to you have to honor that. And what Mike says is exactly right about there are things um, that I was threatened with lawsuits for on the FAQ posted by other people. Those posts still exist, but they're not visible because again, they have to be retained, not under legal sanction, but in order for them to be retained in case anything ever occurs like that, that the history yeah. remains. Yeah, you want, you, you know, you want, those, you want the records. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I, I kept every, every email, every message sent to me by my stalker. I've got every screen cap of everything they ever posted anywhere. Um, why? Just so I got records of it. And and honestly, I was told by by somebody who who knows very well. It's like you, for no other reason, go file a police report, so there is a record of this happening. So if it ever does escalate really bad, you now have a history of having reported this years ago. Yeah. You know, I, I so I did. I I reported my stalker to the local police, to the FBI. I knew they would never do anything, but that wasn't the point of getting them to do anything. It was just to get the record there that this happened. So if something ever did go too far, there's already a record of me documenting and, and, and explaining what happened. So, I mean, get, getting back to this is how message boards get out of control. Is people assume they're uh, they're anonymous, assume they can't be tracked, assume it's just a joke. I mean, the the answer for that tick 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 comment he gave the FBI was it was just a joke. Well, don't that be so sensitive. Work. That's not how it, it goes. It doesn't. You you can't just say it's just a joke. Didn't mean it. Oops. No. You've got to think about what you post. And, you know, I, I, I've always said this about, about the FAQ. I'm like, I don't care. People can attack me all they want. You cross the line when you start attacking people's spouses, kids, parents, family members. That, that's just, that's too far. I I put myself out there. I knowingly set myself up and know this is going to happen. I've known this since the day I got involved with Kiss Online. That that was my decision and my responsibility. Do you think my wife had a choice in this? If you attack her or my daughter or my parents? I mean, my stalker doxed my parents. Nothing ever came of it, but it's like, why would you do that? What attack me all you want, bring it to me. And, and that's where I just see message boards. That small click tends to know no boundaries. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've got two questions, you know, before we wrap uh, the first one, what's your biggest regret? on Kiss Online and your time there or something that you would love to have done that you just couldn't make work? I've always wondered, you know, obviously your time came to an end, but what is something that you would have loved to have done that just, you could never make it happen? Even with everything great that you did have, um, you know, on that. Well, we, we, on that site. It, was, it was one of the last things we were working to develop. It never got finished before I left. Um, so we had, again, we had built our own whole commenting system on stories and content management system for everything so that users logged into Kiss Online. They had an account, so then they could, they could leave comments under their account name. And what I wanted to build, and again, keep in mind, this is early to mid 2000s. I was having our developer build a system where you could pick your favorite member when you created your account, pick Gene. So then your account profile and some of the websites look and feel changes based on that. Now it's got red and blood dripping and stuff like that. We were going to give it a, 
a little bit more of a feel. And then we were going to start giving you, we were going to gamify Kiss, Al- Kiss Online before gamifying anything on the internet was even a thought. Oh, you get X amount of points for every comment you leave. You get X amount of points for every photo you upload, for every review you upload. And we were going to figure out a way to give rewards at the end of the year based on how many points you've accumulated. You know, okay, you got 10,000 points, you get a 50% off coupon in the store or something along those lines. Um, It was completely doable. It took a lot of pro. It was raw programming, PHP programming that I had two developers working on, but I left before it was finished. But I thought that was going to take Kiss Online to a whole nother level of personalization and interaction that it didn't exist back then. I mean, it exists all over the place now. Sure, you get reward points for buying anything anywhere. And, oh, you want to change your profile photo and you want to reskin the site? Yeah, you know that's that's not that's not out of line thinking these days. Yeah. But back in 2003, 2004, that was that was not commonplace. So that was, that was the, I would have loved to have seen that happen. It's not a personal regret, but what I do regret seeing is after I left and they rebuilt Kiss Online, they pretty much trashed and deleted all Erased it past all. I was content. in tears. I, that hurt I was me. just like, I can't believe, and, and, as a as a quick aside, so when I started at Kiss Online, um, I couldn't run. I, I I myself said I and I remember telling Gene this. I'm not going to run Kiss Otaku anymore. It wouldn't it wouldn't be proper for me to run Kiss Otaku as a fan website when I'm running your site. And he's like, that's good thinking on your part. So I offered to sell Kiss Otaku to Sony Signatures, the whole content, and they bought it. They bought it from me. And then I just put it all somewhere in Kiss Online. There was a link that you could click to go mm-hmm. see what Kiss Otaku was like. And it literally just took you into Kiss Otaku, except it was on the Kiss Online servers. So when I left in 2005, they basically deleted all historical content that had been gathered from 1998 no, from 1995 to 2005. News stories, photos, commentary, reviews, anything. That and you know and we're and we're again we're talking a period that was pretty pivotal. It was the convention tour, the reunion tour. That we know what happened, but from a fan's perspective, what the fans were living, breathing, and thinking, gone. Just deleted it all. And I was just like, who would do that? You don't have to delete anything on the internet anymore. It's just let it live on a server. I mean, it's like, what, it took up a gigabyte of storage? I mean, just leave it there. Why get rid of it? That, not, that's again, it's not a personal regret. I just regretted seeing that happen. And I've heard count, I still hear to this day from fans occasionally, it's like, do you know if that still might be around somewhere? I'm like, no, they deleted everything and yeah. started fresh. And there's barely a week that goes by that I don't reference the old Kiss Asylum news archives exactly for that reason. Yeah, it's there. It's historical content. I mean, it's and and listen, sometimes it's just fun to dig into that and go, oh, let me see. What were we thinking and talking about 20 years ago? 30 years ago. And it's like, oh, I remember that. I remember that happening. I had forgotten all about that cool little thing. I, it, it It's just sad that, again, with computers and internet, 
you don't have to delete anything ever. Their storage is basically free. I mean, why would you do that? I just it's not free. I just paid my hosting bill. It 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 baffles me why why somebody would say just delete it and somebody wouldn't go. How about we just back it up to a directory somewhere and just leave it there? But, you know, I mean, part of it was there was a whole PHP database and directory that once it became a content management system, you know, did the person taking over know how to save, export that database and use it somewhere else? I don't know. Or it's just, just a sad. new vision. So that, that leads nicely into this question is, with the avatars, the end of the road having taken place, what do you see as the future for the online KISS community? Because even in the time since December the, what was it, the 2nd, I've seen traffic drop by more than 50%. So I know from real world metrics, um, you know, both on our podcast, on my podcast, I'm talking about uh, with, with my partners, you know, that we seem to be in a very confused place right now as a KISS community about there's so much in limbo about the future. There's so much that can't be discussed in public yet about the future and the now. Um, but what do you see for KISS communities going forward? Because it really feels like it's, it's time for a paradigm shift in a way that one chapter is most definitely over. Yeah, you know, and I, I kind of alluded to this in the interview with Steve Steerwald a couple of weeks ago when he, he took over Kiss, Kiss Asylum. And I was like, do you really see a benefit of Kiss Asylum in this day and age? Because who goes to a, a website to get information from a band anymore, let alone a fan website? We get everything instantly through social media, regardless of what channels you follow, whether it's Instagram or Twitter. I'll always call it Twitter. I'm never going to call it X. It's always yep. Twitter, Facebook. The, la the, the only I here, how do I phrase this? I don't know the last time I actually went to Kiss Online to get any news whatsoever. Tour dates, I don't have to go there. You get them on through social media. News, you get that through social media. The only time I go to Kiss Online is the rare instance that I go to the store to see what new product offerings might be. But the rest of the site, as a fan, don't need it. You just don't need it anymore. You know, websites started as where the fans went to engage, to gather information. Then they were supported by social media early on as a way to get people from social media back to your website. But now websites, I don't, I don't, I, you're, you're right. There's a shift happening. I think you still need websites, but they're not the destination what you go to to get anything. It's more of, here's a flyer for KISS. Tour dates, contact information, store link, done. Um, so what does that mean for the KISS fans? That, that's, an, that's a really good question right now because I think part of what we're dealing with is we are in this transition phase between the touring band and whatever's going to come next. So it's overly quiet and dead right now. I firmly believe that's not an indication of the way it's going to be. I think that's because this is still part of Kiss's transition. And I mean a transition from Kiss owning and running everything to pop house owning and running everything. That transition is not just a blink of an eye. We bought you, we're in charge, we're running it on Monday type of thing. I mean, it's, it's no different than 
you know, Time Warner buying AOL. I mean, that's a big transition that has to happen when when two big companies merge together. It can take years. You've probably worked at companies that have done mergers and, you know, acquisitions. Yep. It can take years, multiple years for a transition to finally complete itself. And by the time that transition is completed, they're beginning another transition. Yeah, it's it's uncomfortable and disconcerting, trans, uh, you know, mergers. Uh, yeah, um, no information re-orged. is being revealed. Yep. yep. Re- public isn't being told what's going on. People within the company might not know what's going on. You know, so basically, as KISS fans, we we are witnessing this transition, but we don't need to know what's going on right now. Meaning, Pop House and or KISS isn't going to sit here and go, well, today, Gene and Paul had a meeting with the CEOs to iron out their individual roles and responsibilities, and and they're negotiating over this fine point. That's the sort of stuff that's probably going on. We don't need to know that. It's not of our, it's none of our business as fans to know all of that. It will get resolved when a year later, six months, eight months, eighteen months. I don't know. It will, and at that point in time, things will get active once again. But what does that active involve? That's anybody's guess at this point in time because we know that Pop House didn't buy the entire music catalog. Biggest piece of misinformation that was floated out there was Pop House didn't buy the entire catalog of music from Kiss. Universal still owns the vast majority of that. I'm guessing the KISS catalog that was sold to Pop House is what, from from Sonic Boom on? Yeah. It'll yeah. be uh, pre-73. And post, I think their last contract expired in 2012. So. Sonic, Sonic Boom um, was not a universal album. Monster wasn't. Meaning they may have they may have released and distributed some of this stuff. They were stuff. licensed to them. They were licensed purposes. to them, which means Kiss is the owner of it. Kiss owns the masters of those. Kiss doesn't own the masters of Destroyer. And frankly, Universal would have been a fool to give up the masters of that back catalog because in this day and age, that's where record labels are making the vast sums of their money are from catalog, not from new releases. And Kiss has got an incredibly strong back catalog. So, uh, you know, what, again, what does that, what does that mean? Does that, 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 that means like future um, off the sound boards would be dealt with by pop house licensed by universal probably. I'm speculating. I don't know any of this. I'm just guessing because you can go look on these releases. And if it says licensed to universal by what was it used to be Sim Stan music or something like that, that meant kiss owns it licensed it kiss owns the master. So it, it, this is a, this is a, this is it's a complex, compli- very complex. It's very complex because this means Pop House still has to work and play nicely with Universal. And to, we don't know, but to some extent, Gene and Paul still have some involvement or say in what Pop House does. So everybody is sort of sitting back going, well, we're not investing any money in doing anything until we figure out who gets to do what. Who makes what money? Who has the final say on this? And we're clearly who not going to rush who? into appeasing the bitching Kiss fans who are mad that there hasn't been a other box set or an off the soundboard. No, that's there are a, things to work exactly out, it. or any of that can happen because it has to. It has to appease 
all the parties. And, all the parties. Yeah. I mean, and and you know the I I don't know if this is true with Kiss and Universal, but I would suspect it probably is, especially with bigger, older acts. Um, Universal probably has vast, not vast, past monies that they've invested in KISS products and releases that still haven't been recouped. Meaning Universal is still owed money from a release. It wouldn't be a it very hasn't record earned... label if they're not. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's common of, of record labels. Every dollar, not do... every penny any record label spends on any band is 100% recoupable. It's basically a loan. And the record label gets to earn that money back, recoup it before the band and any other parties get paid royalties and earn anything from it. Advances, manufacturing costs, distribution costs, marketing costs, all of that is 100% recoupable. So is there a recoupable amount that, Kiss is unrecouped with Universal, and if there is, who's responsible for paying that back? Is it Kiss? Is it Pop House? Is it a combination of them? Um, you know, it's 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 a lot of business. It's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of contracts, and everybody just wants. Trust me, everybody wants to get back to releasing product to earn money, but everybody wants to know. Who's earning that money before they invest more money into it? It's like pretty basic business, Mike. Yeah, it, 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 it really is. I mean, it, it, it sucks for being a fan because, yeah, we're all sitting here going, God, give us something. I don't want another set of T-shirts to celebrate Animalize, which, by the way, what a fucking hideous all over animal pattern shirt that was. But. You know, those were those are little things that can be done from a merch standpoint that probably isn't going to rile anybody's feathers, but a whole new box set needs approvals. That that needs a lot of and that needs band involvement because the label may not have access to a lot of this stuff. So the band's got to open up their their archives to make this happen. Well, who's paying the band? Is Pop House paying the band? Is Universal paying Pop House? Is Universal hiring Kiss? All, all sorts of questions. All I know is we as fans sit back here going, I just want to spend more money and give me something. You guys don't know business. And it's like, uh, they know business. They're getting their business in order. And then it's going to happen. I, I firmly believe at some point in time, Probably sooner than later, we will see the floodgates starting to open. And then um, I'll have something new to complain about. Then, 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 then you can go to the message board and complain about how you were forced to spend $500 to buy this box set. And you were forced to spend $40 to buy this terrible soundboard recording. It's like, if that's what makes you happy, go for it go for it so it's it's just a transition right now for mainly for kiss fans I, i'm sure i'm sure between pop house the kiss corporation and universal they're busy every week working this out you know getting the deal finalized paying the people who need to be paid putting together release plans and strategies for the next 12 months they want to get back to making money they all do, because they all know there's a lot of money you can make off of KISS fans. Here, here. That seems like a very good place to end this, Mike. This is a good reminiscing. Yeah. I, like I said, you know, this conversation with Mike has been all over the place because there's just so much over the past nearly 30 years to talk about. Um, I strongly recommend you check out the Three Sides episode with Steve Sterwald. Um, great conversation that touches on a lot of it and you know what check out some other episodes of three sides of the coin there, as well there's a there's a you'll do a search but there's an old episode many years old with hunter goatley 
Oh, God. That goes way back to the absolute beginning days of KISS fan communities on the Internet with Hunter, who started the KISS Army List Serve, which was the very first place us geeky KISS fans had our heads exploding because we could talk with other KISS fans just like us. Who was the other one? There was Alex, the original Alex of the FAQ, FAQ. I mean, and he yep. quit in August 96 when Bruce and Eric um, departed. And I said, I'm taking over the FAQ soon after that. Uh, but I'm, I'm not the original. FAQ was listserv days. And Alex yeah. was the organizer, organizer yep. I think, when he was at university. So those are the grand yeah. things. Though, though they're, yeah, I mean, Hunter and Alex are the guys who basically really planted the very, very first seed that we all quickly started to grow out of. Um, it, it, I, I just find it's, it's, especially if you're new, new to the internet, meaning if you're new to the internet in the last 20 years, <laughs> you're going to find this history pretty fascinating to understand. Uh, again, creating these websites like you were doing, Julian, and I was doing. It, it's it's a miracle we created what we created back then, with what we what the technology existed. I mean, you know, gigabyte hard drives. That if you had a gigabyte hard drive back then, it's because you had a company that was fucking willing to spend a lot of money to buy you a gigabyte hard drive. It 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 was. Speeds were so much slower. Connections were slower. Quality. Like I said, I actually have in my storage, like all of us good geeks, we've got cardboard boxes filled with cords, cables, and shit that we haven't used because we just might need it. You might need it one day. Yep. <laughs> I got I got four of those somewhere, and that's been weeded down from like seven of them. I've got an old one megapixel Apple quick take digital camera. That was the very first commercially available digital camera. One megapixel. I mean, your, your freaking Apple watch can take pictures better that, than one megapixel. I mean, it's just, what 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 we were working with amazing amazing that that we were that we were able to but like i said we didn't know any better cuz you had nothing to compare it to yeah now now it's easy well michael brownvold Thank you very much for taking the time to look back. I hope we get to do it again on a, you know, a variety of different topics because it's always fun to hang out with you one-on-one -on -one or with your guys. I mean, great podcast, great group of people, you know, so Thank always you. appreciate it. We, 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 we love you having you here. on. Your, your, your books are the best. And yeah, maybe, maybe I'll come back and answer questions that'll pop up in the thread about this, about he's lying, he's scammer. It's, Let's, oh, let's here we see. go. Let's... I, I put it out there on the board. I didn't get too many takers with questions for you. Now that you've heard a conversation, what are your questions for Mike that you would love Mike to address here or there, wherever? It, it, it's not going to matter where that conversation goes down. Um, what are the things that you want to ask Mike? Bring it and on. I, I will say I'm open to anything. I may not remember what you're talking about that that's that's literally a honest statement i mean we're talking about stuff that started back in 1995 you know memory and even kiss online was 1998 might not remember it perfectly but i'm not afraid if you got a question about something specific bring it up i'll do my best to remember it and give you my answer awesome well, thanks again for taking the time, and we'll catch you on Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks, Julian. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final. There are no refunds. 
If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.